Thank you, thank you very much, Manfred, and thank, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I, I hope I'm standing in the right place. It's a bit over this way, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, I need to advance the slides, so I'll stand here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to uh, very much uh, continue the theme of the opening session and speaking about integrated structural biology because I think that's uh, really what most of us are doing in, in one form or the other. Uh, I'd like to begin with, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, the cover of Nature Methods that appeared in January of last year, where CryoEM was named the <clears throat> method of the year. And for many people who are outside the field, this is about when uh, they suddenly realize that there's something new that's going on here. Uh, but I'd like to point out two things. Uh, first, CryoEM is not really a new discipline in almost any sense of the word. And if you look at the his historical development of this field, uh, the very first near atomic resolution structures were done almost 10 years ago. Uh, there's Hong Zhao's work on icosahedral viruses, others who worked on similar areas. And if you look at the, uh, the flood of structures that were done at lower resolutions, uh, you could see that the march of this field already began almost a decade ago. Uh, and as you, as you go through the years, the change that we see is that uh, we see progressively higher resolutions uh, coming into the field. And of course, the most recent excitement is that we are getting to structures uh, at better than three angstrom resolution. And that, of course, uh, is what, what's being highlighted. But the first thing to remember really is that uh, we are really building on uh, really more than a decade and, in fact, many decades of development in this field. The second point, which is relevant, is that uh, when we say cryo-EM, uh, we're actually referring to a much broader set of methods. Uh, and this is uh, essentially in institutionalized in the Gordon conferences that really speak of 3D electron microscopy in the general sense of using electrons to image uh, complexity in biology. Uh, and if you look at where these methods have been used, where electrons are used either transmission electron microscopy or in scanning electron microscopy, uh, there have been tremendous applications ranging from just looking at proteins, which is often uh, uh, what we are talking about when we refer to cryo-EM, but certainly a, a lot of applications to looking at viruses, uh, both icosahedral viruses, symmetric viruses, envelope viruses, uh, and then this whole field of tomography of whole, whole cells, uh, particularly in the bacterial arena, but also being applied to a number of mammalian cells to investigate uh, uh, the, the arrangement and architecture of protein assemblies in situ. And finally, a uh, frontier that is beginning to now come into range is to be able to use electron-based methods to look at the architecture of tissue. So uh, uh, when we say cryo-EM, although uh, it, it's not quite uh, strictly cryo-EM when we look at the larger assemblies, I think it's fair to say that if you look to the next decade, <clears throat> we will probably see uh, application of uh, electron-based imaging methods uh, to image the spectrum all the way from, uh, all the way from proteins uh, to tissue. And one of the sort of biggest lessons we've already learned in the last decade is also echoing what our opening speaker said, which is that understanding biological mechanisms really requires integration of information across all of these lens scales. And that's where mechanis mechanistic information is, is most useful. Uh, in my talk today, I'd like to uh, uh, touch on three separate topics. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak about uh, the use of single particle cryo-EM uh, and the insights uh, that one might gain into dynamic protein assemblies, especially those that might, uh, in one or the other way, be not so easily accessible to, to X-ray crystallography. I'd like to touch on uh, some applications of electron tomography, uh, particularly in the context of subvolume averaging where uh, by combining information uh, of 3D volumes extracted from larger volumes, uh, one actually can learn a lot about uh, the structure and function of viruses and also bacteria. Uh, and finally, I'd like to end with uh, uh, sort of emerging themes in the use of focused ion beams uh, to investigate uh, the structure of large things that cannot be interrogated with a transmission electron microscope because they're just too thick. Uh, so that's the, uh, the outline of my talk. And I'd like to begin uh, with the, uh, some rec recent work uh, we've been doing in my lab on dynamic protein assemblies using single particle cryo-EM. And by way of introduction 
to uh, so the, where the field is uh, in, in looking at uh, you, you looking using cryo EM to look at these uh, structures of proteins. If you look back uh, to almost a decade ago, uh, there were the traditional cryo EM targets. Uh, these were large viruses, uh, large protein assemblies, perhaps. Uh, ribosomes more recently, and certainly the, the pioneering work that Joachim Frank did and Marin Van Heel did started with ribosomes. But tr traditionally, people would say in the early years, is your protein big enough to be looked at by cryo EM? <clears throat> the change that's now happened, <clears throat> happened now is that Uh, where in each case, uh, the structural analysis uh, led to new insights, not just into the arrangement of the atoms and the protein, et cetera, but also into dynamics of the things that these proteins do uh, that might be relevant to their function. Uh, the, the last introductory slide I have is an animation of uh, what most of you know, uh, which is how cryoEM works. It looks relatively easy to execute. Uh, it starts with a, a drop of liquid that uh, might contain purified protein solution and sometimes not so purified protein solution, which is delivered to uh, an EM grid uh, that many of us have used for years. Uh, it's blotted with very conventional uh, Wattman filter paper that most labs have, at which point there's a thin layer of liquid that's left behind on the grid. Uh, this thin film of liquid is plunge frozen in liquid ethane that's cooled by liquid nitrogen. And at this point, the sample is vitrified and if one were using uh, an electron microscope that's manufactured by FEI, now Thermo Fisher, this is what it looks like. You can deliver this into a, into a cassette and a capsule, and it goes into the column of uh, the Titan Creos electron microscope. And what's it, once it's in the microscope, uh, there's a relatively high level of automation in collecting images uh, like the one that you see here, at which point we have very powerful algorithms to cut the images up into individual particles and merge them. And, if all goes well, eventually out comes a 3D structure that contains the, uh, the arrangement of the uh, various elements of the protein of interest, uh, uh, various structural elements of interest in 3D. The, uh, I have to say the, the thing that really uh, uh, led to the revolution in this field uh, certainly has to be uh, in, in good measure due to the development of the direct electron detectors. This is an image of beta galactosidase taken with uh, the Gatan K2 detector, where you can see that single images uh, contain information that go far beyond three angstroms, close to two and a half angstroms here. And it's the use of these direct detectors that really led us to be able to uh, begin to look at some of these smaller protein assemblies. And in 2014, in, in one of our first efforts into pushing towards higher resolution, uh, we determined the structure of beta galactosidase uh, by cryo-EM. And uh, at, at the resolution that we had at that time of about 3.2 angstroms, <clears throat> we were pleased to see that it compared favorably uh, to the work that had come out from crystallography from Brian Matthews' lab two decades ago. And their three angstrom X-ray structure, which of course they improved to be to, to a much higher resolution later on, uh, was very much similar to what we had obtained using cryo-EM, in this case using about uh, 11,000 particles or so. And that, that was uh, very encouraging. Uh, at, at this kind of, at, at the, uh, as we continue to work on this, uh, using these detectors, we push the resolution further. And in 2015, uh, we were able to get to a higher resolution uh, where we could interpret the density features more readily. Uh, here's an example of what this density map looks like, where you can actually place the positions of the atoms relatively easily because you can, you can see them. This is real, in real space, it's easy to refine into these kinds of maps. Uh, and in addition to being able to visualize these features, we look for things like larger densities for sulfur atoms, which you see there, or holes in aromatic residues, which are all the most important and exciting, exciting thing for us uh, was that we could assign densities for a number of water molecules that were hydrogen bonded to each other, 
to metal ions or to other residues in the active sites. And the fact that we could actually visualize these water molecules sometimes in chains uh, was, uh, I think, the in the context of uh, drug discovery in much the way that crystallography has been used over the years. Uh, if you look at this, in this density map, we also had uh, density for PETG, an inhibitor that binds to the active site. And in addition to visualizing PETG, we also were able to localize a single water molecule between PETG and the active site glutamic acid residue and essentially brought us into the realm of being able to do these kinds of things uh, that typically uh, were done before with crystallography. Uh, not, not all the examples that we looked at uh, were at these resolutions. In fact, uh, by and large, most of the work, most of the structures we've, been, we've generated are typically at lower resolution than this. But nevertheless, uh, in many cases, they have been useful function, functional insights. And I'd like to share with you four examples of this, starting with uh, the ionotropic glutamate receptors. Uh, which have been drug targets for a long time in the pharmaceutical industry uh, because of their extraordinary medical importance. Uh, dysfunction of these receptors is implicated in many diseases of the brain, uh, ranging from Alzheimer's to memory loss uh, and uh, other degenerative diseases. And uh, on, but at the time that we started to work on this a few years ago, uh, Eric Guo's lab had published a seminal paper in this field describing the structure of the AMPA receptor in the resting state. And you see a schematic arrangement of that on the left-hand side, where there's a trans ligand binding domain above it, and uh, on top of that, an N-terminal domain. The central question in this field was, and continues to be, uh, the nature of the changes that mediate the gating uh, of, of, the, of this receptor when ligands bind and other modulators <coughs> bind, bind to the receptor. Uh, we were extremely fortunate to have a collaboration with Mark Mayer, uh, who spent uh, about three decades working on the glutamate receptors, the biochemistry, and the physiology. And in these two papers that we published together with Mark Mayer, uh, we, learned, uh, we learned new things about the dynamics of these receptors that, uh, that we did not know before. Uh, in, in the first instance, we were able to get to about seven axle resolution for the kinate receptor, uh, which is one of the, uh, one, one of the su one subfamily of these receptors. And at the, at the resolution that we had at that time, uh, we were able to position in uh, the X-ray structures of the individual bits and pieces that had been known at that time from, from X-ray crystallography. And there was a surprising finding uh, in that in the desensitized state, there was a, a huge change in symmetry from uh, the two-fold to the four-fold state. Uh, the details perhaps more of interest to those in this field. But nevertheless, uh, the EM studies revealed a very large quaternary structural change with desensitization. Uh, last year, we were able to advance this to a higher resolution, and that led to a, a, couple, of, a couple of different things. First, we, we were able to get to a resolution where we could visualize the, the transmembrane helices clearly. We could uh, assign density uh, to, the, to the most many of the amino acids in, in the transmembrane region. Uh, we were able to visualize density for carbohydrates because we were working with prim primarily with native molecules that had not been modified or mutated in any way to lose the carbohydrates. But it led to th these, these and related studies from 2014, led us to a synthesis of uh, sort of the broader picture of how these receptors might engage uh, in, in conformational changes during the gating cycle. And I want to draw your attention in this schematic to uh, the central portion of each, the, the schematic where we are showing the, uh, the general architecture of the ligand binding domain. So in, in the resting state, the ligand binding domain is, uh, is not occupied by ligand. It's, it has this open state and the channel is closed. So there's nothing's going through the ion channel. In the activated state, uh, the arrows indicate the opening of the channel the glutamate uh, has, bound, has bound to the uh, ligand binding domain and it's closed. And this process has a time scale of a few milliseconds. Once this has happened, in the subsequent few milliseconds, the channel, the receptor desensitizes. Uh, pe people had known for years that this leads to a closure of the channel and essentially uh, a return, or return to an architecture in the transmembrane region similar to that in the resting state. Uh, but there was this mystery of actually how this comes about. 
clearly the receptor could not go back to exactly the same arrange arrangement as in the resting state because you would then cycle through this. So it was known that the desensitized state would have a different conformation. And as we saw before, uh, from the lower resolution studies, what you see in the schematic uh, that's to the right of the receptor modules is that we go from a twofold, uh, twofold arrangement of the ligand binding domain shown in these four colors to one that looks appro approximately fourfold. And that's uh, shown here in, the, in this arrangement here. At seven axon resolution, we presumed that this was uh, uh, essentially a fourfold symmetric arrangement of the receptor. However, last year, when we went to higher resolution, we realized that this actually wasn't quite correct. It was almost fourfold, but uh, there was a slight mismatch or a slight stagger between two pairs of these, of these E helices, uh, a stagger of approximately six angstroms. If you now look at the top view, which is the, what's shown on the upper right-hand side, uh, you, you can get a sense of the fourfold arrangement. But when you look at the side view, which is on the lower right-hand side, you can see that there's a slight, uh, a slight stagger. Uh, Joel Meyerson, uh, who really led this work in the lab, uh, noticed this. And it led to essentially our, our, our current thinking of how this works, uh, which is the discovery of this desensitization ring, which we think actually is what stabilizes the desensitized state. And uh, it's, its disruption, we, we believe, is what takes it back to the, uh, to the resting state. The, uh, the other sort of interesting story that came out of these studies was the finding that the expectation we had from cross-linking studies that desensitization uh, may not involve a very large structural change compared to the resting state was actually completely wrong. Uh, there were chemical cross-linking studies which suggested that similar residues were cross-linked in both the resting state and the desensitized state. But what our structural studies showed is the changes were so large that the cross-linking actually was to the neighboring subunit, suggesting that there was nothing wrong with the cross-linking studies, but indeed our, our expectation of what the extent of the change would be uh, was incorrect. A uh, second example with ion channels I want to share with you is uh, with the ion channel core A. Uh, and we started to work on this uh, in collaboration with Eduardo Perozzo at the University of Chicago. And the driving force for this was a single, uh, was a sing the single driving force for this was a way to understand why it is that X-ray structures of the ion channel in the presence and in the absence of magnesium were approximately the same. The, the root mean square deviation between these structures, of which there were many by crystallography, were uh, very, very small, typically in the range of an angstrom. And yet the biochemists and physiologists knew that this couldn't quite be right. And in, in a work that we published last year uh, that was led in the lab by Doreen Mathis, a postdoc, uh, with many others contributing to this, uh, we first began by determining the structure of this magnesium channel, uh, at that time for us a relatively small protein, 200 kilodaltons, but helped a lot by the fact that it was five-fold symmetric. Uh, we were able to determine the uh, near atomic resolution structure for the magnesium bound state of core, and indeed it was, it was very similar to what the X-ray structures had shown. Uh, but when we took the magnesium away, uh, to our great surprise, uh, Doreen found that there were an ensemble of uh, open states that were populated. Uh, the principal one, uh, there were two principal ones that, that uh, came out of the analysis. They all had complete loss of five-fold symmetry and uh, variable movements of each of the domains. So uh, at least in these studies, the removal of the uh, constraint of the crystal lattice uh, to no longer be confined to a five-fold symmetric arrangement. But we know that it comes back. So clearly, this is a reversible process. But it really changes, uh, changes the way we think about uh, the gating mechanism uh, in, in these kinds of uh, ion channels. Uh, and and the, essentially, the important idea that they are no longer constrained by being symmetric. Uh, a second set of examples I'd like to uh, uh, share with you is work we've been doing in metabolic pathways. This is a long-term interest in the lab. Uh, we've been uh, at looking at enzymes and metabolic pathways for well over a decade. And many years ago, uh, before the advent of electron detectors, when we had CCD detectors, uh, and the ability to look at large, large assemblies, we worked a lot on uh, larger complexes. In particular, we worked on pyruvate dehydrogenase which is the enzyme complex that produces acetyl coenzyme A, uh, in work that we had begun in collaboration with Richard Perham uh, in, in, in the University of Cambridge. Uh, acetyl CoA is a molecule critical in virtually all, all organisms. And the approach we took is uh, one familiar to uh, all the people in the EM field from that time, 
where we collected lots of images of these large things at that time, 500 angstroms across. We had density maps typically in the range of 20 angstroms to 30 angstroms, of which we did many. This is work that Jacqueline Milne uh, really uh, uh, pioneered in the lab with various subcomplexes of various kinds. And out of it emerged a general idea of the mechanism of how acetyl-CoA is synthesized. Uh, we could not have done this without knowledge of the X-ray structures. We, the main discovery from the EM work was the identification of a gap between the, uh, the catalytic co core that uh, where, the, where uh, uh, the coenzyme A molecule meets up with the two carbons to make acetyl-CoA and the positioning of the decarboxylase uh, moieties on the outside. But the, this was very representative of the kind of thing that we were able to do where we would use density maps at say 20 axiom resolution and position X-ray structures into it. And in instances like this, we could actually make something, deduce something useful about the mechanism. Uh, our interest though now in the last few years has been on many of these smaller molecules, uh, th things that are small and dynamic. And normally this is not where uh, we would have done cryo-EM in the earlier years. But now we've been looking at various subfamilies of uh, pr pr proteins in the, uh, I involved in metabolic pathways. And the example that we've reported on recently concerned dehydrogenases. Uh, many dehydrogenases are implicated in cancer uh, and actually are active, uh, active targets. And we use these dehydrogenases both to, uh, both to evaluate the potential of cryo-EM to uh, be informative in the drug discovery paradigm and also technically to find out what we could do in terms of getting to looking at smaller and dynamic uh, molecules. And they fall into various categories. Uh, in the case of glutamate dehydrogenase, uh, it's about 330 kilodaltons, uh, a protein that has variable order from inside to the outside. Uh, you can see this in the density map that, uh, that's shown. Uh, you can see that uh, despite, the, despite the presence of this uh, variable order from inside to the outside, uh, we can get uh, respectable density maps uh, for glutamate dehydrogenase. Uh, as a pioneer in the lab, Alan Merck, uh, Alberto Bartosaki, and Sujay Banerjee, who collectively teamed up uh, to work on these enzymes to, to find out what we could actually do, do in terms of resolution and in terms of size. Uh, work that we did on, uh, on lactate dehydrogenase uh, was also informative. This is a somewhat smaller protein complex. This is a tetramer. Uh, a little less than 150 kilodaltons. And here our inter interest was to position uh, molecules in this case, an inhibitor that GSK had reported but not reported the structure of in complex with LDHB. Uh, here we are showing that we can visualize density for the ligand itself. The density is not, not as good as the, the rest of the map, but nevertheless it's encouraging that it maps to almost exactly the same region that other similar inhibitors map to in, in where, crystal, where crystal structures have been reported. Uh, perhaps the most interesting of this set uh, for us though was the work on isocitrate dehydrogenase 1. Uh, IDH1 is uh, one of the important enzymes in, in, in mitochondrial metabolism and uh, in normal cells uh, the function of IDH1 is to produce uh, alpha ketoglutarate from isocitrate. That's uh, the function of wild type IDH1. However, when there are mutations in a specific residue arginine 132, uh, which typically converted to cysteine or to histidine, uh, the, uh, the, mu the mutant molecules instead produce 2-hydroxyglutarate, which is an oncometabolite. Uh, this has been no known for some time, and one of the reasons why there's tremendous interest in pursuing molecules leading to clinical compounds for IDH1 is that the, the, the presence of this mutation is very much restricted to specific types of tissue and specific types of tumors. So if you look at the plot on the left-hand side, which shows the incidence of this mutation in various tissue types, uh, the one shown in red uh, it corresponds to gliomas, and uh, three, quarters of the, three quarters of IDH1 mutations map to gliomas, suggesting that this may lead to uh, a, a more focused uh, the chance to getting a therapy that actually treats this and uh, a, a number of companies as well as NIH are actively involved in finding molecules that have the special property of binding the mutant enzyme but not the wild type enzyme uh, and there has, be, there has been significant success already uh, so, so in the basic science arena and how well it translates to the clinical side remains to be seen. But from, our, from our perspective our interest was twofold. One was to localize 
the molecule, uh, the small molecule, uh, in this case is called ML309, was it discovered at the NIH. And uh, the idea was to be able to position this in, in, in IDH1 because there, were no, there are no crystal structures for the complex of ML309 with, uh, with IDH1. Uh, the fact that this is a small protein was also encouraging to us that we could do this with these proteins. But the more interesting, uh, biologically interesting finding was that not only could we position this molecule, we, we identified uh, the fact that the binding of this molecule leads to a, a conformational change. And this is interesting mechanistically, uh, not just for this inhibitor, but for others, because it points the way to uh, using this particular structural change as a means of knowing that you actually influence the function. It's conceivable that other molecules might bind without these kinds of changes. And indeed, this is, uh, this is really what we are try trying to pursue right now. Uh, we hope to be able to compare the binding of this molecule with other inhibitors whose structures have been reported. So on the right-hand side, you see a superposition of uh, uh, the binding sites of three of these inhibitors. Two of these come from X-ray structures. Uh, they come, one, one, one comes from GlaxoSmithKline, the other from Sanofi. But uh, what you see just by the color coding is that each of these inhibitors binds to a slightly different site. And uh, the binding of these and many other inhibitors uh, may or may not influence the conformation in the way that we've seen with ML309. So this uh, remains an area of active interest and really was made possible uh, with a very close collaboration with the NCATS Institute at the NIH uh, that really uh, is actively involved in uh, working in molecules of this kind. Uh, the last example of a dynamic assembly that I'd like to share with you is our work on P97, uh, which is a AAA ATPase and also a cancer target. The National Cancer Institute has an active program to develop inhibitors uh, to this molecule. And uh, coming into this, uh, we knew that P97 was a molecule that had many roles in cells that you can see on the left-hand side involved in many processes ranging from degradation to autophagy to uh, uh, various other kinds of, uh, other kinds of processes uh, that are critical for, for, for the cell. Uh, we also knew that there was a structure for P97 uh, work from Axel Brunger and colleagues uh, in the ADP bound form. Uh, and our challenge was to be able to understand more about the functional cycle of P97. And for this, clearly, we needed other structures. We also knew that it was very, very difficult to get by crystallography the structures of the ATP bound form of P97. Uh, and uh, the solution to this came from cryo-EM studies uh, where we determined the structure of P97 when ATP gamma S was added. We discovered that uh, in solution, uh, there were three coexisting forms of P97, uh, which came out almost canonically as you would expect. Uh, P97 has two nucleotide binding domains. And what our studies showed, by computational separation, we could actually tease out uh, these three states where the nucleotide occupancy of the domains was much as you might expect. In one state, there was ADP in, in e these two nucleotide domains. In the second state, there was ADP in one state exchanged with ATP gamma S. And in the third one, both of these molecules were, uh, both of the domains were occupied by ATP gamma S. The range of motion involved, uh, triggered by the change in nucleotide occupancy is quite substantial and explains this in some respect, uh, to some extent, why it is this would be difficult to crystallize. That, that captures uh, the overall structural change. You can see that in the presence of uh, the, in P97, the exchange of the first site uh, with ATP gamma S leads to a structural change in the, the region colored magenta. But the binding of the second uh, ATP gamma S molecule leads to a much larger structural change of the end domain. Uh, the fact that these three states are present together, of course, would be a showstopper for crystallography. But because of the advances in image processing methods uh, and, and the fact that data is actually uh, is much better than before, we can actually uh, tease out these three states. But our real interest, though, in addition to understanding the mechanism, is to be able to localize small molecules in the face of all of these structural changes. And in particular, the uh, work at the National Cancer Institute uh, was driven towards identifying small molecules, in this case, uh, based on the phenylindole uh, backbone, uh, to be able to bind them to P97 and uh, f find this binding site. And what you see in the foreground is a superposition of these three states I showed you in the previous slide. So the whole thing is, is relatively dynamic. Uh, but in, 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 in a very lucky stroke, uh, we were actually able to get to relatively high resolution with, with this molecule bound. And this is work uh, done in the lab by Sujay Banerjee 
Alberto Bartosagi, Alan Merck, and many others, uh, in collaboration with uh, a, a consortium of scientists at the NCI working at UCSF, at Caltech, at Pittsburgh, who really, uh, who really brought this to a stage where we could actually contribute the structural biology. Uh, the structure itself of the, uh, the protein, you, you can see the expected features at these resolutions. And we also continued to learn, uh, this was the first example where we saw these kinds of features clearly, uh, where for residues such as arginines, we could, we could observe the dual occupancy of the terminal gonidium group in these two, two positions, just, just in terms of the real space density. Uh, but also, more importantly, we got what we were after, which is density for the, the uh, ligand uh, bound, to, bound to P97. From the, fr from the map and the structure, we could then get to our, our target, which was to be able to map the inhibitor binding site in, in, in detail. And that immediately led to identifying the regions that were important and the one half of the, of the molecule that actually was not having very many interactions. So uh, the fact that we could do this uh, with cryo-EM, uh, I think really uh, for us uh, has been extremely encouraging. But it was because of a lucky stroke that we were able to catch, catch this protein, if you will, uh, at a stage before it entered this conformational cycle. So this is schematically captured in this, uh, uh, in, in the, in, in this cartoon, where we're showing that in the cycle of conformational changes of P97, uh, driven by ATP gamma as binding, uh, the ones at the, you know, the, the two o'clock and the five o'clock and the six o'clock positions, they have different, different states, nucleotide occupancy states. The molecule that uh, we were able to determine the structure of in complex with P97 actually prevents the molecule from entering into this conformational cycle. It binds at the interface between the two nucleotide binding domains. Uh, and it's very different uh, from the effects you might expect molecules that target the active site. So this uh, idea of interfacial inhibitors is not new, but we have a very good example here of how this actually uh, is very relevant in the context of looking at inhibiting proteins that are allosteric and have these, this very large uh, landscape of conformational changes. So my, my, uh, my, in conclusion of this section, I'd like to uh, uh, point out what I've always felt, which is that the, the cryo-EM field is really evolving, continues to evolve. It's more of an evolution than a revolution. Uh, and we really are seeing changes that have taken almost a decade or more, more to build on. Uh, I'd like to now speak a little bit about electron tomography, which is another area that uh, is actively undergoing development and a number of very interesting applications. Uh, and I want to highlight two examples in particular, uh, the applications to uh, the study of virus structure and uh, the applications uh, very briefly to looking at the organization of uh, intact cells, in particular bacteria. Uh, well, my own interest in this field began with uh, its applications to HIV, where we were confronted with uh, a, a problem that uh, is, is immediately uh, difficult, it's complex, but also one that needed a significant computational uh, intervention. Uh, what you see on the left-hand side is a, is, is a cryo-EM image of, uh, of HIV, where, you, where the, the, the main features of the virus are immediately apparent. You can see that each of these variants are differently shaped. They're differently sized. They have var variable morphology. And they have variable numbers of what we call spikes, which are the trimeric envelope glycoproteins on the surface of the viral membrane. Uh, using electron tomography, one can actually deduce the overall arrangement of these molecules on, on the surface. And the way this works, many of you are familiar with this, uh, it's done using by tilting the specimen in the relative to the electron beam. Uh, the principles of this are very similar to that in a computerized axial tomography. Uh, and the basic idea is, uh, is shown in this, in this video that shows how we start from uh, HIV that is uh, dispersed in, in a suspension uh, where we plunge freeze uh, to create uh, vitrified specimens much like uh, we do, much, much like we do in uh, protein cryo-EM. And once it's plunge frozen and delivered into the column of an electron microscope, we can tilt the specimen relative to the beam and collect images, uh, which you see in the upper right-hand corner. And in an experiment that takes typically between, say, 30 to 45 minutes, one can collect uh, a tilt series and convert that computationally to a tomogram. Uh, this tomogram uh, is very noisy because we are taking care to minimize the damage. But nevertheless, it contains information. And this is the unit of data that comes out in, 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 from, from this experiment. Uh, using computational tools, we can then search 
the surface of the stomogram for uh, the, all things that sit on the surface. And the HIV envelope glycoprotein trimer is the only protein from HIV that sits on these viruses, so it's a little bit easy. And uh, many years ago, we actually showed that we could uh, properly, uh, properly average these molecules in 3D and derive a, a low resolution structure for the, uh, for the structure of the trimeric envelope glycoprotein. And what you see here is the way we were doing it then, which is to take the x-ray structures of GP120 uh, that P Peter Kwong had really done so many of, uh, and uh, we could actually place this into, uh, into the trimer. And this led to some insights into how, these, uh, how the trimer actually uh, sits on the surface of the membrane. Uh, over the years, we've done antibody complexes with numerous antibodies, and this led to uh, an understanding of the structure of the envelope glycoprotein on the surface of, uh, surface of the virus. And this, uh, this is interesting to us because we really want to know what happens at the instant of entry, what happens when HIV actually makes contact with the cell surface. So instead of uh, going to the cell surface, we brought the molecules and receptors uh, to the viral membrane where we reconstituted either CD4 or the uh, FAB molecule on, onto the surface of the uh, viral membrane. Uh, one of the early, early insights from the study was the identification of these very large quaternary structural changes uh, that happened in CD4 binds. We showed, for instance, that there's a very large opening of the spike uh, that leads to exposure of GP41, the large structural changes. And these were, at that time, very low resolution uh, studies. And uh, in recent years, Andrew Ward's work in collaboration with Ian Wilson has really uh, transformed the way we think about this. There's numerous high resolution cryo -EM structures, and much of the stuff that we only uh, scratched the surface of before are now delineated in much more detail. Uh, many questions remain, though, in terms of knowing the structure of these proteins as they sit on the surface, surface of the virus. I'd like to highlight some of those. One of them is understanding uh, quantitatively the nature of the conformational heterogeneity. So what you see here are two instances uh, of this kind of heterogeneity, uh, where on the one hand, uh, we, we are trying to understand the, the distribution of different conformations in a mixture. <clears throat> so you might have spikes that envelope glycoproteins that say open, partially open, maybe fully open, bound to ligands, unbound to ligands. This is whole distribution of these, uh, these, uh, these states. And in some instances, they could be unique to, uh, unique to each variant. So each variant may have just one kind of conformation. There's more complex cases, actually more typical, uh, where when there are multiple ligands present in solution, uh, this might be closer to the case in vivo, in patients that have HIV, uh, that there's, there's, a comp there's a heterogeneous mixture of uh, envelope glycoprotein spikes to which uh, various molecules are bound, sometimes antibodies. Uh, and the computational tools to dissect this uh, are actually being developed, but much more needs to be done. And then there is the third layer of this, which is uh, to understand uh, the nature of dynamics that actually alter antibody binding. binding. So we, we and others have now shown that antibodies that actually bind, uh, not the resting state, but, the, but bind triggered states, open states of the, uh, of, of the spike. And so these, may, while, so these may be transiently sampled states, but it could be possible to create antibodies that actually trap the envelope glycoprotein in these conformations. And so uh, we are very much uh, working towards uh, dissecting these types of conformational changes, working uh, at lower resolutions, but working also with native infectious viruses. Uh, some examples of how uh, we've begun to use this are shown here for uh, related applications. We've been working in influenza, which uh, has many, shares many similarities uh, with, uh, with HIV. Many the work, work that Winfried and others did have pioneered th this area of understanding how these things work. Uh, but here's an example of uh, the pandemic, 2009 pandemic, which some of you will remember. Uh, what, we were able, what we were able to show uh, at, at the one level was the binding of antibodies uh, in the stem region of the influenza spike uh, to, the, to the HA molecule present on the virus. In addition, we were also able to count the antibodies. So I, I don't have a slide to show this, but uh, we, we now routinely are able to actually measure the number of spikes on these viruses that are actually occupied by antibodies. And that's a new layer of information that we did not have before. Uh, the, a, the area that we were actually pushing towards, uh, though, is to make, uh, uh, to, to, make a, to, to contribute uh, usefully to vaccine design. And this is work we've been uh, work, uh, doing recently with Peter Pelise uh, and Florian Kramer at Mount Sinai, uh, where we are working with a chimeric uh, hemagglutinin molecule. This is displayed 
on a universal influenza vaccine candidate. And the work from Peter's lab has shown that these chimeric molecules elicit very strong and potent broadly neutralizing antibodies that bind the stem region. Uh, we are therefore naturally interested to find out what makes these chimeric molecules, uh, these chimeric viruses different. Uh, and uh, here's a, really a first report of uh, what we find with these, uh, with these viruses. Uh, when, you look at the, uh, when you look at these chimeric viruses, you can see that uh, they're, they're packed with HA molecules like other influenza viruses are, the normal ones. Uh, there's a, here's a tomogram that you can actually walk through. But when you analyze this quantitatively, uh, there are some very interesting differences. Uh, what we've now shown is that in the chimeric molecule, the one that elicits uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, when used as an immunogen, the structure of the spike is essentially opened out. There's a, there's, a, there's a relatively large twist in the outside, essentially opening sites that might not be normally displayed. Uh, we also now find routinely as a metric that we can measure the density of the spikes on, this, on the variants, and we showed that the density of the spikes on the chimeric strain is actually higher than that in the, uh, the normal H H1N1 strain. Uh, these themes actually are useful not just for HIV and influenza. We've also applied this to Ebola. Uh, that's also been very informative, especially given the uh, sort of recent interest in, in Ebola infection and the va vaccines for Ebola. Uh, one of the first uh, pieces of work, uh, this was done in the lab by Erin Tran uh, in collaboration with Judy White, uh, was to show that, that we could actually localize the mucin-like domain uh, in, 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 in the Ebola spike. Uh, this, is, uh, th this was known to be present, but because of its flexibility and because, of its, uh, uh, because it was difficult to capture crystallographically, the EM studies did contribute a little bit to, uh, to the overall arrangement of the, of the spikes, although there's very good crystal structures uh, uh, from scripts of the, uh, of, of the trimer, trimer itself. But where we see, uh, see this going is to be able to do experiments like what's shown here, which we reported last year, where we are now able to map the location of binding of various uh, antibodies in the ZMAP cocktail uh, to the Ebola glycoprotein. They're very similar uh, to what's been discovered for the isolated glycoprotein, so that's very encouraging. Uh, but uh, the fact that we can do this on native viruses uh, is, is one of the powerful things of tomography, and I see in the coming years that this will be a very much more general application. Uh, the, the, it's a, I, I wanted to mention that the front end of tomography, uh, th there have been tremendous advances in resolution, and I wanted to feature briefly work from John Briggs, uh, who has really led this area in showing that one can use tomography and subvolume averaging to get to near atomic resolutions, which uh, I think many would have thought this to be almost impossible even a few years ago. Uh, but in this, in this work that uh, they reported last year, uh, we now have, for the first time, a structure where subvolume averaging methods have been combined with tomography to derive near atomic models, in this case of the HIV-1 capsid with the SP-1 linker. And uh, by, certainly biologically and from an HIV point of view, this is an extremely important result. But technically, uh, it tells us that uh, we can actually get there uh, with subvolume averaging, perhaps for other systems as well. Uh, the idea of using subvolume averaging, of course, is not restricted to viruses. It's been used in many other contexts. And one example that we had done in our earlier work was to use this to look at chemotaxis receptors in, in bacterial cells. And our interest there was to be able to describe con the conformation landscape. Uh, in work that we did, and uh, parallel work uh, was also being done in Grant Jensen's lab, uh, we, we knew at that time that there were these hexagonally packed receptor arrays on, in, in, in these bacteria. And uh, one of the useful things that came out of this phase of the work was we could use subvolume averaging methods and tomography to derive the, uh, the conformational states of the receptor and actually find out how this changed when we added ligands, when we added serine or other molecules. And this, uh, this was one application that uh, was important, but stayed at low resolution. Uh, but more recently, uh, I, want, I also want to feature this because this is a particularly exciting advance. Uh, this comes from Grant Jensen's lab, uh, where they've steadily worked a way to uh, pushing the resolution envelope for electron tomography. Uh, and in this, uh, this instance where uh, they, they, uh, they, re they reported last year, the studies of type 4 pili in bacteria. Uh, single individual tomograms uh, allow you to visualize uh, in instances of these pili that you can see shown here by the white arrows. But what's really powerful is to combine subvolume averaging 
and derive uh, what are working molecular models for assemblies as complex as the type 4 pillars. And I think this, uh, if you look at the work in uh, the HIV tomography to, to get gag at near atomic resolution or molecular assemblies for something that is so incredibly complex, uh, I think there's little doubt that tomography will increasingly grow in its use and add, add to uh, uh, what's conventionally seen as single particle cryo EM. Uh, in, in the last section of my talk, I'd like to touch on uh, methods to use uh, focused ion beams and scanning electron microscopy to derive subcellular architecture. Uh, this is work we've also been doing for some time, for many years, uh, almost a decade ago, we began to work with FEI to adapt the methods that had then been in vogue in the semiconductor industry to use focused ion beams, which are very abrasive, to bring them into biology to essentially cut into things that you could not possibly look at by transmission microscopy. Our first subject was, test subject was yeast cells, a dividing yeast cell. And uh, the way this works is to use focused ion beams to essentially abrade away uh, the surface layers of, these, of, of the entities of interest. And as you do this experiment, you, by taking images, with a scanning electron beam, the one can see the sample disappear. But because we are collecting these images, we could stitch this together uh, into a 3D image and uh, obtain the 3D structure. At that time, we started with about 200 nanometers spatial resolution. We are now down to about 5 to 10 nanometers routinely in, in 3D. Uh, we worked over the years in many, many different examples of cells and tissue and cancer and various other areas. I wanted to briefly touch on a review that uh, I wrote with Kedar Narayan in the lab. Uh, on, on these methods. This came out in 2015, where we now streamlined the methods uh, to, to be much more robust. The methods of actually coating to, to increase conductivity are more routine. This is this multiple manufacturers that provide this, uh, this capability. This particular one is done with the Zeiss uh, uh, focused ion beam, SCA microscope, where you can see the process itself is now largely automated. Of course, it uh, looks more automated in the animation than it might be. Uh, but uh, we now have routinely runs that run, go over a, a couple of days or so where one can interrogate the 3D structure of uh, whole, whole cells. And uh, once these images come out, one can then uh, process this uh, to basically clean them up to get uh, blocks of images where the edges have been cleaned up. And from, these, from the 3D stack of images, one can then segment this uh, uh, either manually or semi-automatically to delineate the surface, surface of these regions or, in, uh, as you will see in a minute, uh, also to walk into the interior of these cells. Uh, this uh, animation was produced by Kedar and Donnie Bliss at the, at the NIH. Uh, one example that we have been using it for, uh, where we publish and also continue to actively uh, apply this to, is to look at muscle in 3D. And uh, in one of the first applications of this to muscle, we showed that in work that we did with Bob Balaban, who's worked for three decades or so on muscle at the NIH, uh, that indeed we could follow and trace the distribution of the mitochondria in, in, in muscle. And if I sh the pictures that you see on the upper right-hand side, uh, if I were to tell you that those are individual mitochondria, uh, and if you hadn't seen this, you wouldn't believe it, but that's what they are. Each of these are a single mitochondrion. They're very different from what you expect to see in textbooks, uh, from textbooks. And uh, in, in the animation that you see below, each color corresponds to a single mitochondrion that forms this uh, extremely interesting network uh, within muscles. So, uh, so the kind of information that we are now getting from focused ion beams uh, is, is actually very general uh, and ap applicable to essentially any kind of tissue. And uh, this is, uh, this is a, one of the data sets we reported, and I think this, this very data set is now also on the EM data bank uh, to begin to populate uh, data, data of this kind, very large scale, uh, large scale data, uh, data sets of this type where there's so much to be done in terms of mining the information. And our hope is that by, by depositing this, it will lead to other discoveries uh, that we probably did not pick up. The last five to 10 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, end on a somewhat sad note. Uh, uh, Gavin E. Murphy was a postdoc in my lab uh, and was a <clears throat> PhD student fr from, Grand, uh, from Grand Jensen's lab. Uh, he, he passed away two days ago. Uh, he, was, uh, he suffered from degenerative, uh, 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 neurolo neurolo neurologically degenerative disease. Uh, he was a dear friend to many of us. And I wanted to highlight uh, his work in particular because he pioneered many of the methods that we use for focused ion beam microscopy in my lab. And I want to uh, 
uh, in his honor, uh, mentioned the three projects that he, he worked on that led to really seminal uh, advances within my own lab in terms of what we were able to do with it. Uh, the first of these projects was the work uh, that he did uh, on imaging melanoma cells. At the time that uh, Gavin came to the lab, uh, Jürgen Heimann had shown that we could uh, use focused ion beams to walk into cancer cells. Uh, we could see the mitochondrial architecture in exquisite detail that led to uh, interesting uh, an understanding of how the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum were arranged, but these were individual examples. And Gavin's uh, first project, uh, which was really is still the only example I know of uh, where we directly applied this to a disease model, is, uh, was his analysis of the changes in mitochondrial architecture in a disease model called methyl malonic acidemia. Uh, children that have this uh, defect, these are mutations in methyl malonic, uh, methyl mal methyl malonic CoA mutase, uh, rarely make it past the age of two, sometimes a lot less. And in work we did with Chuck Venditti, a physician at the, uh, at the NIH, who works with these patients uh, and with a mouse model that he had developed, our interest was to find out if one could actually predict uh, the, the onset of this disease before any biochemical measurements could be made. Uh, so what Gavin did was to compare the uh, architecture of mitochondria in normal mice and in diseased mice. And uh, the expectation we had, based on ev everything in the literature at that time, was that this was a mega mitochondrial disease, that we would simply find large mitochondria. Gavin quantitated this and found that this was not the case. The volume was about the same, the surface area was about the same. But the most unexpected discovery from that work was that in the mice that were going to eventually develop this disease, there was a concave. Uh, the, the, the positive Gaussian curvature was different already before the disease was manif manifested itself. And this, uh, as I said before, is the only example I know of where these kinds of things actually predict what biochemically is identified much later. And my hope is that uh, these kinds of measurements might be more useful in the general con context of other diseases like cancer. A second problem that uh, Gavin worked on uh, was uh, in the context of work we were doing at the time on cell-cell transmission of HIV. And broadly, here, here's the problem uh, Quentin Satintau uh, had al already identified and defined uh, what a virological synapse was, which is the junction between a dendritic cell and a T cell. And uh, our interest was to go beyond what many of us could do at that time, which is to do a transmission EM image of a thin section. So what you see on the right-hand side is a dendritic cell in contact with a couple of T cells. And if you look really closely, you will find viruses at the junction called a virological synapse. Uh, the surprising discovery we had made at that time using focused ion beams, and this was done by, by Levi Feltz, a postdoc in the lab who sat right next to Gavin, uh, was the finding that these synapses were not these 2D entities that TEM showed, but were very complex 3D entities. In this 3D image, you see the yellow is the T cell and the gray is, is the dendritic cell. Uh, what uh, Levi showed is that these were, these things that we call dendrites were actually large envelope membranes that were enveloping the T cell that was in the cover of PNAS a few years ago. And it became very important to now understand how general this was. This is very controversial at that time because it suggested that the access of HIV to the synapses might be sterically blocked, uh, diffusionally blocked simply by the fact that there were these membranes. Uh, so we wanted to find out how general this would be uh, because the hypothesis that came out of these studies was that dendritic cells would hold on to HIV and the T cells that were going to be infected actually went out to get these, uh, get these viruses. It was not the other way around where people thought HIV would go to T cells, the T cells would pick it up. So here we were saying that T cells actively recruited uh, HIV to themselves and got infected. The hard part was to actually show how general this was. And this was Gavin's uh, undertaking where he actually came up with uh, methods to study very large volumes of T cells, T cell synapses. Early in HIV infection is T cells that count. Uh, and we always worried about finding out what happens to these T cells early in infection. And using methods that he had developed to speed this up, Gavin then identified uh, what became a more general phenomenon, which is that T cells that were about to be infected would also essentially go out and reach, reach out to these viruses. What you see in this animation that Gavin produced is uh, an infected T cell in the center and uh, the uninfected cells around actually appear to be chemotaxing towards the infected cell in the middle to pick up, the, uh, to pick up HIV uh, that eventually would then infect them. Uh, not only, not only did, did this make this a more general observation, 
uh, but also led to new insights into the synapse itself, which at that time uh, was really not clear how similar it would be to an immunological synapse. And Gavin's work showed that we could actually tease apart molecules at the interface show where CD4 was, where it wasn't. And in addition led to uh, what now is fully obvious and accepted, which is that using focused ion beams, we could identify long range cell cell contacts that you would simply not identify by confocal microscopy. Here are two cells apart by 40 microns. If you look at it with a fluorescence microscope, you would not pick up any connections between them. But by focused ion beam microscopy, because we can look at the whole volume, uh, Gavin showed that, that for the first time that actually uh, these, uh, these, were, uh, these cells actually did interact. And not only that, uh, that these interactions would simply be missed uh, by confocal microscopy. And some of this actually was, this is his image, was featured in a piece in the New York Times uh, where they were describing some of these viral infections uh, and the Im imaging tools to look at the viral infections. The last thing that, uh, the last project that Gavin did, which was uh, really set, set the course for much of the work in my lab uh, in subsequent years, uh, was a cell biologist dream, which is to be able to look at something in a confocal microscope, point and click, and walk into it in 3D. And in work he did together with Kedar Narayan, uh, they actually did exactly this where they showed that uh, starting with T cells, uh, this is a live confocal image of a T cell about to be infected by an HIV particle. You could then transition from there into a 3D image of the same cell using focused ion beam SEM. Micro, uh, SEM. Uh, at that time, this was done with chemically fixed cells. Now we can do this with uh, high pressure frozen cells. But the point was that once we had this image, it then opened the door open the doors to computationally figuring out where the HIV was, because we could then mine this volume, and each one of these bright specks that you see corresponds to what the computer thinks an HIV particle is. But of course, most of these are false positives. But because we have the confocal image, we can cross them, and it leads to this correlative imaging. Uh, it, it's very sad that we had to lose someone like this, and uh, I just wanted to show these slides in particular for the family and, and his friends who miss him. I'd like to end with uh, where I started, which is to uh, uh, point out that when we say cryo-EM, we really mean 3D electron microscopy. And I think that in the years to come, uh, these methods will, uh, will be applicable not just to proteins, but to viruses, to cells, and even tissue as we ex extend the envelope of these methods. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Okay, hey, thank you, Three Ram. Any questions? We have a few minutes. Oh. It's a beautiful talk, um, Shiran. <clears throat> so I have a, a question about the second part of your talk about tomography. So one of the uh, <clears throat> um, great um, power of uh, electron microscopy is that you can capture uh, metal, metal stable states. Uh, some of the viruses look at the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the chemical proteins you, you examine by electron tomography. I was wondering uh, whether you have, um, you talk about the variations of structures, uh, whether you have seen uh, the post-fusion states, which are suppo supposed to be more stable than the pre-fusion state. Uh, <clears throat> so the question you're asking is a general one of these, for these envelope viruses, yeah. HIV and influenza. With influenza, we do have the post-fusion state, and we have antibodies that preferentially bind to one or the other state. Yeah, so the, indeed, that's, uh, so that, the post, the post, that state of the influenza is a long-sought uh, target. And indeed, we now have, Erin Tran in the lab has been working on antibodies uh, that actually preferentially uh, trap the post-fusion state. And then, yes, it's, it's still at lower resolution, but indeed, uh, those metastable states can be stabilized by antibodies, if that was your question. So, so, so the so-called post-fusion uh, should be called in quotes because they actually, in that case, in your case, there's no fusion. Yes, exactly right. It's in post-fusion in quotation marks, exactly yeah. right. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Hi, Sriam. I have a question about the first part of your talk, single particle. And uh, you had this slide of P97, 
with two side chains moving in inside the density. May could you maybe come back to this? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So now, you know, when we get typically high resolution data, we use to, to deal with it just like we did with crystallography, to build atomic model where we can see and, and leave out uh, regions where we don't see. But, but this type of examples, it probably justify to, to use a, a principle of molecular dynamics for interpretation of the data, which is currently is not the mainstream. So how much you think th there is a place to involve principle of molecular dynamics and how to deal with it in the terms of deposition of the data and so on? So, so your, your question is whether when you get data at relatively high resolution, if we could use molecular dynamics to understand this better. I think pro probably so. It's just that you know, we don't, uh, don't have much experience in this. And generally, uh, uh, we are doing really what the, the, the simplest thing is, which is we visually can refine into these two, two positions. The pe people who do this quantitatively could probably do a much better job and refine for this. Uh, but the problem with molecular dynamics is if you, uh, to go there, I mean, I see you, you, it also, you know, it needs to be, it needs to be able to lead to something, pred predictions that we can then test experimentally. But here we are, uh, I think this is probably the zeroth or maybe below, below the basic level of, we're just showing it as it is. Uh, but if, if there were to be molecular dynamics, I, I imagine that it would lead to predictions that would then be testable. So I think it's clearly that's the growth area to apply molecular dynamics. I have a question regarding these small molecules bound to the EM densities. You mentioned that the resolution is usually lower than the overall protein. Do you think it's because, I don't know, your, your case was symmetrical proteins because you lose the symmetry of the molecule as a, or is it a general phenomenon that the small molecules are low resolution? It's, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, I have actually looked at the data bank at uh, almost all, st all the structures that report small molecules bound to proteins. And invariably, I find that they, the density there is weaker. Uh, one might presume this is, because, this is because the binding is not perfect. It's, uh, it, there's obviously some interactions are maximized, some are not. Uh, but I think it's a real thing. I don't believe we have looked in, uh, in cases where we, we, have, we have some background. We have looked at losing symmetry, and it still, uh, it still doesn't go away. So I don't think it's a, uh, due to symmetry. It's due to probably intrinsic wobble in the binding of the molecule. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was really awesome.